Black people didn't necessarily take her in, I guess, in that way to say she is ours. She is one of ours. So at least in an hour, and I'm speaking of Greg and I, you know, as being Black folks, in our in our circles, Roberta Flack's name is not necessarily listed in the pantheon of great Black female singers. Um, do you feel that she felt that? Did she yeah. Did she have, what was her experience of, of that? I can't speak to specific things that she said, but I can, I can know without a doubt that the first couple of records not resonating with black audiences probably freaked her out. This is the I'm All Over the Place podcast. I'm Dara Star Tucker. Greg Bryant here. And we are so happy today to be joined by none other than Adam Dorn, who's also known as Motion Worker. He is a producer in his own right, but he is also the son of Joel Dorn, who produced Roberta Flack's first five albums. So thank you so much, Adam, for joining us. Thanks Thank you for being here. Yeah. Yeah, so excited to have this conversation with you um today about your your dad's work with Roberta and with many other artists I mean he was involved in some really historic projects and so just I appreciate you for taking this time to talk to us today my pleasure first of all I just so I could say it to you live like adding Bill Eaton into that video you have no idea how amazing that is like he is he's really one of these unsung like he deserves his own like peace or you know not maybe in this context but he's so heavy and so unheralded like Mm. you know like literally unsung like the guy's had his hands and so much amazing stuff yeah Um, like i said i did just the two of us and that's where i ran across him and ralph mcdonald but it really wasn't a deep thing i was trying to keep it to 60 seconds or 90 or something and just get out of there but yeah i didn't really get a chance to investigate him was he involved with with roberta's career he was involved with roberta he was involved with you know, the, the interesting thing about the way Atlantic worked is that everyone worked with each other. So Arif Martin, a producer, would still work with my dad and do arrangements for my father. Or, or mm. you know, I wouldn't say with because my father wasn't a musician. But um, and then Bill was an arranger that worked, you know, at the studios. I mean, he worked independently all over the city. But my father worked with Bill all the time. He worked with Ralph all the time. He worked with Bill Salter, William Salter all the time. Like Mm -hmm. um, they all, they, they started a production company because Ralph was an incredible record, was an incredible record producer. And they saw similar, like a King Curtis. Ralph was like the MD. Like if Mm -hmm. you were on a session, chances are Ralph hired you. Mm -hmm. Um, And Bill, you know, Eaton, William Eaton was the arranger. Um, so he would write all like, you know, the horn parts and string parts and all that kind of stuff. And then what a team. I mean, and they brought similar and and we'll get into Roberta, like similar, similar to Roberta, like Ralph brought so many musicians through. He's like the art Blakey of studio musicians. Okay. He brought so many incredible guys through the filter. Um, I mean, that he then brought, went on. Um, Sorry. That's it. Wasn't he the one, if I remember correctly, that reached out to, um, he was the one that was friends with um, Grover Washington and brought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just two of us. Yeah, and yeah. when they when they recorded those those tracks, Mar- actually Marcus was telling me because I we were babies. I mean, I was like ten, you know, maybe mm. younger. But um, when they re- they just recorded instrumentals, the, the guys playing on the tracks had no idea Bill Withers was going to be on the tracks. Wow. Okay. No, okay. On, or on Dutch track. You know what I mean? They mm-hmm. Grover needed a producer, and Grover was the best, by the way. Like, Gro- talk about like a That's king cool. of Philly. Like, yeah, Grover was one of the coolest guys ever. And I had so many friends that played with him, but um, but back to these guys and Roberta, in a way, because they were all about bringing people through. They were all about you know, it, you know, like Marcus Miller was brought through as a studio musician in a lot of ways by Ralph, mm-hmm. you know, and these like, inc- and, and Luther, Luther came through Roberta, Marcus came through Roberta. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say M. Tume came through Roberta because he, okay. he really, he had been playing with Miles and, and, and he and Reggie Lucas, you know, they made hit, you know, massive hit for her, but like 
her thing with musicians was she was really tough but she was really supportive of musicians like there's a there's a bass player that lives in delaware that was in m2 mace camp named basil fearington and he played with stephanie mills and and roberta and like he's incredible musician and he was like roberta was at my wedding she she paid like she was so supportive like she just treated musicians unlike most artists treat musicians that she brought them through she knew when they were they needed to leave the coop you know what i mean mm -hmm. like luther and marcus mm -hmm. left at the right time they were they were they were becoming too much to be in in her camp mm -hmm. and she you know so i'm sure she was it was bittersweet and she didn't want luther to not be you know but luther's at this point singing on every tv commercial for every urban based market you know mm -hmm. product you know that luther sang miller genuine draft and budweiser at the same time <laughs> hey. you're not supposed to do that you are not <laughs> yeah and i just remember i you know when i spent i spent a lot of time around him and he, and he was like yep i did it i didn't care i wanted that check and i was <laughs> wow. go but um yeah um you know roberta's fascinating because as she's like her own in a lot of ways she it was like she caused issues for herself more than for musicians or for for she was very supportive but she could sometimes not get out of her own way um mm -hmm. definitely you know and and it's i love by the way that you focused on the fact that first time wasn't a hit it wasn't a hit at all for a couple of years Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, I still don't know how they won the Grammy like two and a half years later. Right. <laughs> they must have changed the rules in terms of your release. You know, maybe it was. Yeah. Well, I think they what they did was they just released it as a single after that. Oh, OK. So, yeah, that's what maybe allowed it was a new edit that. or something. Yeah. yeah. They trimmed mm -hmm. it by a minute and released it as a mm -hmm. single. OK. Got yeah. it. So that makes sense. But yeah. she wasn't resonating at all. Yeah. She mm. she was like an, an artist lost at sea. And, and the thing is, and and and. I don't know that people, real fans would make the connection, but it wasn't really until she did the duet record with Donnie that it blew up because they had, that was a big record. That was not a small record. And at the same time, within a little while, you know, you get Killing Me Softly and then everyone knows who she is now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was, you know, she sold like, I don't know the numbers, but it wasn't a, it wasn't four million. It was like right, 30, right. thousand records and people were like, oh, she's, she's, She's wonderful. I don't know where she fits, you know, and it's mm -hmm. kind of like that Nina Simone thing where it's like, well, she fits. She's brilliant, you know, and sooner or later, folks will catch up. Mm -hmm. And they did, you know, mm -hmm. but it really was in a lot of I mean, my father hung up on Clint Eastwood like two times before. he, You know what I mean? That's he was like, I, it's not you. Why would you call me? You yeah. know? Yeah. Um, he did the same thing with Miles Davis, too. Miles. Hey. Called him. Yeah. Yep. Miles called him on a Sunday, like randomly. I think, you know, in the late 60s and, and he had just produced that Joe Zobinal record where it's just Zobinal and it's that it's the it's, one it's, to cover that freaks you out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. it didn't freak Miles out. Miles called my old man because he wanted to know who did it, why it was chosen, what, why that aesthetic was. He loved it. He, wow. He, so they talked on the phone. I mean, you know, M Miles, Miles was awesome, but like to get a phone call from Miles. Yeah. Click. Yeah. <laughs> like, just yeah. Like, yeah. Hi, Miles. Tell Wayne and Kirby I said hi. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, know yeah. you just not believe that. But no, not but, at all. But no. it is. But but the thing and I have a theory about Roberta and Donnie is that she. I think she had animosity that Donnie was resonating, and Donnie. You know, she Donnie gets to Atlantic like kind of a little bit after her and then really strikes a chord and really resonates not only with black community but crosses over and like donnie's donnie's a thing and he's the genius that we all know he is like mm -hmm. and it, boom people yeah. recognize right away and i think that she uh, it's so it's so difficult to be political but i think that she was pissed you know mm -hmm. she was like oh you know he's huge and i'm not and I was here first and, mm -hmm. you know, there's, it's a lot of artistry and ego and, you know, um, emotions and, you know, struggles with things, you know, she's, she's, 
she's so brilliant that I honestly, I, I, I think that she could not get out of her way. Like, and then mm. honestly, I worked with her on one session. I worked with her on a bunch of sessions, but on one session she walked in and she was very, very if she wasn't feeling it, she'd just leave a session, you know? Whoa. And, and, but to do that when there's like 45 string players or 50 string, you know, they, you know, I, I saw her leave a session that was an orchestral date. And even at the age of like 17, I, you know, I was just there in the back in a corner just watching. And I was like, that's not good. <laughs> you can't, that's not good. Like that's a very expensive, uh, I'm not in the mood today kind of thing. You what, know? Around what time would that have been? That would have been like mid late eighties. Uh, when Marcus Marcus produced a record for her called Oasis, okay. and it was I, my I my father and I referred to it like because it should have been a hit. Like mm. the song Oasis was so well made and so well crafted, and it was perfect for what she should be doing. And and we just referred to it as like, and even Marcus laughed at this. It was like a twenty nine foot leap between two buildings thirty feet apart. <laughs> it was oh. like it was like it was perfect, and and you know like the all of it is great, and it just it didn't happen, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. And it was a very difficult record to see get made because she would. I I, I use uh, the terms she she would steely dance stuff not let go of stuff you know how like the mm -hmm. whole steely dan they take like a month to get like a guitar solo or you know mm -hmm. that kind of thing she would do stuff like that and it's just like it's maddening because you're you're just like you gotta let go of things you gotta you know you gotta make decisions that you don't have three years to make this record you got producer that's working on five other records right now you know yeah so, yeah wow i didn't know this that. was something you said that your dad produced produced this no no, Marcus Miller produced Oasis. Okay. Okay. And this was around that time she had like a hit. Remember she had a hit? Was it Set the Night to Set Music? Set the Night to Music. Yeah. Yes. With Maxi Priest. Was it Maxi Priest? <laughs> I don't remember. And they're totally disparate artists. Like there's no real connection there in terms of like, no offense to him, but like she's Roberta. Like she's, you know, you know her as one name. Like I don't think anyone says, that's Maxi. You know, it's, it's Maxi Priest. He's he's good. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Maxi. <laughs> Yeah, I did like your stuff. <laughs> Just <laughs> the burner was really heavy, and that was a strange pairing. She she had these like this period in the eighties where she like Peebo Bryson hit and a Maxine mm -hmm. Priest, hit. but she wasn't. I didn't feel like she was like the Roberta, like the extension of those first five six records. Mm -hmm. He kind of just did like, well, we're now we're going for hits, and that's mm -hmm. why the Marcus thing was interesting because there was a bit of that going on and, and having been in her band, he really understood how to work with her. But what I thought was really cool, and this flipped me out, is he would call my old man and be like, what do I do now? She's doing this. I need, you know, he would <laughs> ask for, because he knew those first five records that my old man did, he knew that my old man was put through like the grinder, like yeah. on a level and, you know, she she didn't have the same energy in 1988 as she did in 1969. She came in and she knew what she wanted. I think for the first for first take or you know she she recorded like 40 tunes. They mm -hmm. they recorded like that's why like a lot of them were on the first take. They, those musicians were phenomenal, and they just made the record really quickly. You know, mm -hmm. she just went in and recorded. Um, and it's, I mean, those first. Those first record, those records are so good, and I'm glad. I'm so happy you brought up Gene McDaniel's. Um, you know, come on. I wish know. I could have met him, man. He's he's a hero. Man, he was he was a trip. I, I only met him. I only met him like once or twice, um, mm -hmm. and he was super cool. And like the fact that you had a hit with that song multiple times is so great. I mean, you know, with Les and Eddie, you know that that sold like three million records. That was a massive hit for him. You know, yeah, yeah. but but the, it's just that community of people all working together, and the fact that you know Roberta had these like great songs to choose from that weren't hers. You know, no one also mentions that like a lot of these songs. You know, you you brought this up perfectly. Um, they're covers. You know, mm -hmm. first time killing me softly. She mm -hmm. didn't write those. You know, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. But but I want to I don't want to just 
monologue you know like it, there's specific, <laughs> yeah because it's like i'll just reminisce and get sentimental and just like i don't know like i i spent a lot of time around her in creative environments and it was really a trip because i was really a kid and then i was a kid like i was 17 18 and i'd be around her with a different perspective because my old man wasn't there so i'm watching it and i'm like I'm not somebody's kid right now. I'm plugging in microphones and I'm on the session. And as a matter of fact, I actually went out of my way to not let her know I was my father's son because I never knew where their relationship was. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? She would, she was, you know, she was pretty contentious. Um, my father didn't have a lot of interest in that. So he would, he wouldn't play into it. And I think that pissed her off. She wanted like fisticuffs and, you know, like some arguing and you, I not not going to do it for you. You know, I'm done. And he he seems so cool. I got a chance to talk to him one time and I mean, cool. And, and I know he probably had a pretty, you know, aggressive side if he needed to be, but we're just talking what you about, said, we're talking about Joel Doran. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, my dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> unaware. yeah. My dad. Adam's dad is, is Joel, the producer, Joel Doran who produced first time ever I saw your face. And you said the first five, the first albums, five albums. I didn't realize it was flat. that many. Yeah. 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 And, and there's actually a great, story about the sixth album where and I, I love telling this now because it's so beyond statute of limitations but Atlantic <laughs> owed him money and Roberta was basically producing her sixth record because they he just agreed like I'm done like mm -hmm. I'm just I'm, I'm I'm out five records is I this this has been tough yeah and so she made a record and Ahmet Erdogan uh didn't like the mixes so they called my old man and and his engineer Gene Paul and they said, "Listen, can you fix these mixes on the? Just keep it quiet, but like we'll pay you to do your thing because these tracks aren't where we want them." And um, my father was like, "Well, you guys, and this is so great. This is such another record business." But my old man was like, "Well, you guys owe me a bunch of back royalties, mm. so why don't you give me those royalties and a fee, and I and I'll we'll do it for you." We'll get you a big hit. So he took the tapes and I'll never forget it. He took the, the, the primary, the master tapes, whatever, you know, and he put them on the sofa. He had them there for two weeks. He got his money and he gave them right back. <laughs> he never, he never did a thing. He was like, Oh, you want to play games and you want me to work okay. with Roberta? Like, you know what? She produced this record and I think it's good. I'm not messing with her vision. But I am getting my money from you guys. Oh my God. <laughs> he got his money. And I love telling that now because it's like, you know, we're talking like 1976. So I'm like, who's gonna come? Like that money, that money was probably gone the day he got it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I just love like people talk about hustlers and like, you know, and I'm like, that's that's a hustler. You wow. Know? Yeah. Yeah. And I remember I became really kind of good buddies with them too, man. I told him that story and he was like, man. That's the, that's, uh, he's like, that's the best shit ever. Like, you, know, <laughs> you got yeah, to do that to Atlantic, you know, because they, Atlantic was, they were pretty rough. Jerry Wexler and, and Amit, they could, they could put you through the, you know, the grist mill, you know, they, they, and they could also, they treated, it was a great family, but, but they also like, they would, they would, they could mess with you, you know? Mm. Um, so, mm. so yeah, I just think like, it's funny, like, I would always talk about my old man, Roberta, especially when I started getting around her. And he was just like, it's indisputable that she's one of the better artists of her generation. Um, it's just that there's there were so many, there was so much overthinking. Like, I, I don't even know if you guys would notice this, but she refused to license her music for years. Mm. She would not let it get used. She would, she would like, I remember she she did a, like a perfume commercial and i remember hearing it she did like you'd be so nice to come home to or whatever like that that mm -hmm. standard and i was like well that's roberta's music he's like no 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 she was hired by mm -hmm. an ad agency to sing that that's not mm -hmm. a record that she made and i was like wow you would never hear killing me softly in a movie you would never. she started out and you heard first time but then that shut down you just didn't mm -hmm. hear her music and i think that was always especially when licensing became, you know, in the late nineties, early two thousands, you know, something where it was extremely profitable and it would, you know, I'm like, my dad was like, can you please break, break your own little rule 
and license some of this music, it'll it'll get the catalog to sell, it'll raise your profile, you know, more than it is at right now. Um, and she just refused, mm. you know. And there were a lot of artists from that generation that did the Doors and Beatles mm. did. Oh yeah. Like, you know, they refuse and they, they look down on it. And I just remember coming up and being like, you could use my music. Right. <laughs> you could use, do you have a car that, that has four wheels? You could use my, I was like, I'm not going to sell any records. This is how the lights will stay on, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but she was just so, she was anti that. She did a lot of stuff like that where it would, it would keep things from selling or keep things from being exposed to people that hadn't heard it. Um, I was, I think it was challenging. It was challenging to their relationship on that level. Mm. Um, and, but I will say in defense of her, they always had like a deep down kind of respect thing and a real, there was a friendship there. It was just on a lot. There were a lot of rules <laughs> to mm-hmm. the friendship. It wasn't, but yeah, she would, she would pop up at times and I would just be like, she could be amazing. And she'd be incredibly supportive and kind. It just, there was, it was on a spectrum. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. And I, I mean, and it, you know, now at this point in her life, I know that she's dealing with, you know, major health issues and, you know, I, I don't know what her day to day is, but I, I, you know, I know that she used a lot of energy on having lots of rules. Like, mm-hmm. and I, and I talked to musicians from that worked with her and they, they, they all learned on the, you know, there's an ebb and flow you kind of just feel it out like anyone else really but you know i just don't remind me of someone very specific that i'm not going to call out i'm gonna let greg ask or 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 tell his story about your dad and then i have a question specifically about his career that i don't know if you can answer or not but i'll throw to you and then well it's 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 actually more of a um a situation that i feel like they were the perfect artist producer marriage and i wanted to get adam if he could to kind of tell us about, you know, Joel Dorn's acclimation early on to black music because he loved everything and not just that, he loved different things. And to hear how multifaceted Roberta is as an artist, I felt like she needed a producer who was as open and had as open ears. He wasn't an industry guy, he was a music dude. So for people who may not know, like what kind of um, music did he grow up really championing that made him want to get into the business in the first place um when my father was 14 he started a correspondence with Nesui Erdogan the 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 least talked about Erdogan brother and Nesui was the co-founder of the label he came in a little into after they started the label and Nesui is why they signed Train why they signed Mingus why they signed the MJQ which I still can't believe Everyone sleeps on the MJQ. It's like the most elegant intellectual stuff ever. I love them. And he, my father wrote a letter, not knowing it would get to Nesui. He didn't even know who they were. He just, he, he heard Ray Charles and he, his entire life exploded. Like that was, he was really into music as a kid, but at 14, he was like, nope, this is it. I want to be around this. And he started a correspondence with Nesui. Like to the point where they were sending him records when he was like 15, 16. And, and like Nesui really was like, the, whoever this kid is in Philadelphia, his spirit and his his passion about this. My father would send songs to the label for Ray Charles. He would say he should do this, he should, you know, and they were like, they kept an eye on him. But I also thought it was like, they supported it. You know what I mean? It was like kind of very not common for you know, a 14 year old kid from like West Philly to, you know, to And, and what, what period of time would this have been? It would have been 50, so it's a 42, so 57, 58 mm. in there. Okay. And, and the thing about my father. Is I'm sorry, Adam, up. I have one more question. Cause I'm, I'm the, I'm the non like super intense music nerd. So I'm asking oh, okay. for me and then for yeah. also for the listeners who don't have the information that you guys have. What oh. type of music was Atlantic creating at that time? Atlantic was literally the epicenter of like blues meeting rock, meeting jazz, meeting gospel, meeting mm. blues. So, and what they did, unlike most labels, is they were just like, 
you make great music, we don't care who you are. You could be wow. Jewish, you could be black, you could be, because it was started by Turkish guys and a really okay. aggressive Jewish guy named Jerry Wexler. And they were like, we want the best music on, on the planet. So we, this is this is the the Ray Charles movie. This is the label that he signed with initially, the, his first yeah. label, correct? Uh, and it's arguably where he did some of his best. I okay. agree, agree. Okay. Because that's where Hank Crawford and Fathead and the, and those little big bands and that's just those are machines. They are that, yeah. that those bands, you know, and they continued, but it wasn't the same. Um, in my opinion, like. Mm -hmm. There's that magic you get when an artist finds their voice and they get like a four year run where it's just like, I mean, what I say, I mean, just like, you know, you be my baby, like those, those records, I can listen to what I say top to bottom. And it's like the entire record is like Sgt. Peppers to me. It's mm -hmm. like, it is, it is genius. Mm -hmm. But to continue the Atlantic experience and my father's experience are very similar. My father grew up in a 50, 50 neighborhood. Most of his friends were black, you know, he had his one, my father-in-law was actually his childhood best friend, my, my dad's friend, Cosmo. Wow. And it's a kid from Philly. But I'm just saying, like, it was a unique experience in Philadelphia to live in a, in a very integrated section of the city. And that, you know, hey, it's just you're exposed to music that you wouldn't hear. And you're you're open to so many things that I think it just it 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 it, it charted the course for my father's creative and musical journey just uh, not ignorant you know. ignorant question was your dad jewish yeah we okay i think he still is <laughs> <We're> <laughs> <laughs> i would like to think that he would remain jewish okay. yeah he was jewish and um you know our full name is dornblum actually and mm, he, okay you know, and he had to shorten it he didn't have to but it was like common practice you know, in the 50s and 60s, Jews in this country just, mm -hmm. you know, you went from Goldstein to gold, yeah. you know, uh, you you just did that. I continued it because I figured I'd follow my dad's footsteps and it's Dorn, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, that's how it's known. But, and Dornblum's an ugly name. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, yeah, on base, Adam Dornblum. Like, that doesn't mean anything. Like, you know, yeah. Oh, he's so funky. Um, no, but. You know, so he really grew up in an integrated envi environment and Atlantic was the perfect place to land um, because of that, because he mm -hmm. was so schooled and and just immersed in all music. I mean, you know, his primary focus was jazz and, and, and R&B, and that's mm -hmm. where you go. If you want to produce records in the mid 60s, Atlantic is, you know, other than Motown, which didn't really do anything other than Mo Motown was Motown. They Much. didn't do a lot of string. And to <clears throat> right, right. I have one more question, Dar, yeah, before, yeah. You, before yeah. you. Um, and it's interesting on um, Joel Dorn's path that he becomes uh, a radio DJ. Yeah, as yeah. The, you know, step between, you know. Yeah. And one of the people he meets on his jazz radio journey is Les McCann. Oh, yeah. Uh, Talk, talk about that because that has a Roberta connection eventually. It's a major Roberta con connect. It's the oh. Roberta connection. He, he, actually, Les and Rasan. Okay. Rasan was a was a was a Rassan connection. Mm -hmm. But uh, also at the radio station was Ed Bradley from Sixty Minutes. Oh wow! Whoa! On the FM side, so they shared the studio overnights, and Ed and my father worked together for years, three years, you know, oh. at the station while they were at, at Temple University. Mm. Um, and Les, Les is just one of those guys. Have you ever met Les? Have you guys ever been around Les? We, we talked over the phone, had a great, another great conversation. But I don't yeah. know him like you. I don't know him like you. No, no. I, hey, I mean, he's he's just one of those guys. You meet him and, like, you could be friends with him in 30 seconds. Like, he's just great. And I think he came in um, to the station and my father and Les just hit it off like literally just became buddies. And the thing is the station was the final connection to my father getting to Atlantic. So if you think about it, if you're Atlantic records and you've been corresponding, you know, you're Nesui Erdogan, you've been corresponding with this kid in Philly who now is on the top jazz station in the city where that meant, that really meant a lot to Atlantic because he could break their records. He could literally, they saw, 
regional spikes in sales because he su he supported them and it wasn't like it wasn't what station was this? what's that what station oh what it was temple temple university had a jazz station called what which cracked me up because it spells what but um <laughs> they uh yeah what <laughs> um but he was on the station and all artists that came through that played at the, at the showboat or, or or I'm trying to remember the other major. Oh, uh, Pips. Pips. Pips or the showboat. My father effectively would sometimes be the MC on those gigs or take the guys around town. Like, so, you know, Ming, like my father became friends with everyone. He became friends with Cannonball. He became friends with, if you can, you know, believe it or not, he was friends with Mingus. He was friends with you know, the, the, the crusaders, like the, anyone who came through, they just, they just, it was instant community and connection. And he was really doing good work for Atlantic without even being an employee. And at a certain point they were like, would you, would you want, would you want to come into the fold? Cause you're really doing your, you're breaking records that we didn't think would sell the way they are. Mm. So we kind of owe you. <laughs> so they gave him a shot, you know, in 64, I think was the year. That's awesome. And he would have been 22. And the first record that he did for them was a Sonny Stitt record mm -hmm. um, called Deuces Wild. And the best, mm -hmm. best, best aspect of that record. What a great intro to the record business is that Sonny, because he was always recording. Sonny had already recorded the record with another label. He just did the same songs in the same <laughs> order. And they went in and, and Atlantic ended up buying the other record. And they're like, you know, and my father couldn't have known. But what a great entry to, you know, a, a, such a treacherous business yeah. that the first record you produced was already made by the artist for another label. It's just, it's so incredible. <laughs> and I, you can't write that. It's like, you know, Woody Allen meets someone. I don't know. But um, so, yeah, he was like, whoa, all right. Got to get over this hurdle. Jeez. Mm -hmm. But. But yeah, less less in particular. I remember, and I'll tell like a PG version of it. But less just kept calling my dad about Roberta. My dad was like hanging up on him at a certain <laughs> point. He's like, I don't, I don't need another. You know, like he was he was working with Bette Midler, and he was working with like he, he was like I don't need a, like a nightmare artist. Like I don't want. And he had he had a premonition that she was going to be rough, and he was right. Mm. Um, and, you know, might be sexist, it might be whatever, you know, stereotyping, but like he, I'm sure that there's not enough Maalox in North America for, to replenish what he took while he was working. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> well, you know I what I mean? Put, I think they put the quote in the, the have you seen the Roberta documentary? On I, the I, I haven't watched it just because it's too emotional for me. Oh, like, yeah. like, for some reason, I, I first, when, Lots of folks blew up my phone and they were like, oh, you need to watch this American Masters. And they do they do incredible stuff yeah. like they did that Miles doc that mm -hmm. I love that Miles doc that, that Aaron and, and Vince did. Um, but I just was like, I just I would ask friends like, just please tell me it wasn't made by her camp. Like, I, is it balanced? <laughs> is it even? And I heard it was. I heard it was kind of great, you know, bless mm -hmm. you. Um, <laughs> Did you no, like it? Good. I was, yeah, I was going to say there's, I think, I don't know if there's a quote that I found online or if it's in the documentary, but I think mm -hmm. I put it in my piece because I used a lot of footage of the documentary in the piece mm -hmm. that I did uh, for the breakdown. But yeah. there are quotes of him saying, I don't want to work with any more uh, chick singers. I don't want to work with any more yeah. singers because they're yeah. just, they were nothing but problems. They, he, there were no quotes of him saying that she was a problem, but. No, no, no. Just in general. Like, yeah. it's funny. You know, we we worked together. He really produced it, but I did a, like a couple things. But we worked with, uh, you, you know, Jane Monheit. Do you know? Oh, yeah, he's total sweetheart. And mm -hmm. I remember my dad was about sixty, and he was like, "Finally, finally, an artist that just goes, I like how that sounds." <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a good take. Thank you so much for helping me get to that great take. So he's like, "Where were you in 1968?" You know. And it, she's such a sweetheart and so, you know, she's great, but I, you know, just whatever. She's actually, a, she's actually a friend of ours. I saw that the other day. I did not realize that she had worked with your dad. Um, oh, that, yeah. I think it's called Surrender. Is it Surrender? That album? There's like two or three records, okay. I think. Yeah, yeah. It's like she, he got her signed 
and then did 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 they did well she was did she 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 had a nice pop to the beginning of her career and those were so much fun records those were they were so it was great to be around them like i was working on tons of other things and i would just visit my dad in the studio with no you know uh i love visiting sessions when i have no responsibility you know what i mean like so i would just come in i think i played on one thing she wanted to do a cover of a bonnie ray tune i don't know if it made a record but she's just the best she's a total sweetheart we had a we had a great time and it was like Buster Williams and Ron Carter and Fathead and like just mm. great musicians. You just get to sit and watch record, you know, it was, it was great. But, but, but back to, I don't want to digress back to, um, you know, Roberta getting to the label. Hassan and Les were really instrumental. Mm -hmm. And my father at a certain point and you, and, and you did, I, I remember you used a clip and he was like, you know what? We'll sign him. I know Wexler was like signer. Too many musicians are talking about her. Too many people are excited about this school teacher playing in DC and just like everyone goes through. All the musicians would go through her gig and check it out. So it's like, it's a no brainer. You're just signer. And that's why I think they recorded like 40 things because they didn't know from a production standpoint, like let her do her thing. Let's see what we have. You know, that's why you record 40 songs. I'd love to hear all 40, you yeah, know. I have no idea where they are. There's rumors that, you know, Atlantic stored their tape library in like a non-temperature controlled location that got burned down. Mm. A lot of famous mm. Atlantic, you know, recordings that are just gone forever, you know, because they, they wanted to save money on storage. So, of course, that's what happens. It was like a department store that had an attic. And it was one of the guys at the label. It was like his family owned the store. So they're like, well, put the tapes there. Such a dumb move. It's like mm. a short-sighted, you know, budget move. Um, but I wonder if those tapes are around. I have, um, I actually have test presses mm. of, of a bunch of Roberta stuff with my father's notes on. You know, wow. so I have Killing Me Softly, Mix 12. Wow. <laughs> and I don't know if that's the mix. That's the thing. Like, and I don't want to play test pressings because they wear out, you know, they're they're acetate, they're not vinyl. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, that's one of the wilder things is that like, you know, she gets there and they know they have something, but they don't know what to do with the something they have. It she's she was very challenging for she wasn't she's like a she's an artist for everyone labels are so short-sighted you know i remember my father produced the neville brothers for a m and they're like oh we'll work it to black radio and it's like no no you don't work the neville brothers to black radio you work the nevilles to radio like you you, you know it's the short-sightedness and the and just the it's kind of racist actually like music just be oh this is black music and it's like mm -hmm. um no it's not roberta is like americana and folk and jazz and r&b and it's everything so you know no wonder you didn't sell records for a couple of years you didn't promote this to everyone you mm -hmm. know and it, it's it's such a hallmark of the i think labels well now it's different but labels really shot themselves in the foot with assumptions, you know, about where artists would resonate and not resonate. You know, she obviously did really resonate. It just took a couple of years and thank, thankfully it did, you know, you know. Well, he was with, he produced, um, cause I'm getting ready to do also an episode, uh, a breakdown on killing me softly. So he produced, oh. it sounds like you're saying he did that one as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. And that's the one that made everything explode. First time was a big hit, you know, Killing Me Softly was a world beater. Mm -hmm. It was number one in like, I don't know how many, it was like ridiculous. I wish that I was like six, seven years older. So I could just be like, oh, do you have the number one record in the world? You know, like mm -hmm. with my, you know, my, meanwhile, my friends in suburban Philly would not even know what the hell that means. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, um, he did Killing Me Softly. And there's an interesting story about it that I think Roberta would refute but I think it's pretty hard to refute because I had two people who told me the same story, which is killing me softly. If you think about it, the lead, the lead instrument on killing me softly is a kick drum. Mm. It's the loudest thing in the mix. It's louder than her. And it, and it changed a guy named Gene Paul uh, mixed it. And Gene is the son of Les Paul. 
Mm. And Les Paul had a lot to do with multi-track recording and inventing multi-track recording, but he was smart enough to send Gene to Atlantic to learn from Tom Dowd. And Tom Dowd is like, you know, one of the best engineers ever and one of the better producers ever, easily. And they, my father and Gene had this idea to have this like heartbeat kick, just like pull you in. Mm. And they worked on it for really not a short amount of time. They mixed Killing Me Softly, my father said, was like months before mm. they got the mix that they wanted and had to fight back and forth with her because she was on the road when they were mixing it. So they're mixing this record and she's only hearing, you can imagine as an artist, you, you want control over how the recordings are, you know, and I don't blame her. I mean, as an artist myself, I wouldn't want someone mixing my music for months and I'm out on the road. And what does it sound like? Are you ruining it? Like if you're prone to like not trusting and, you know, but that record changed a lot about how basically R&B records and, and soul records were mixed. I mean, like you don't get to D'Angelo without having that kind of like that concept of like kick drum in the lead, everything coming back out like a, you know, uh, it's almost like a, you know, comes to a point, you know, and the vocal just floats over everything. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's a wild thing. He produced that record and he was fiercely proud of it because I think he and he and Gene worked so hard on it and they they would always kind of like Heisman trophy her because they were like, no, we're onto something. We are not changing this mix. They were, there were, there was a lot of contention and fighting mm -hmm. and I hate to not agree with an artist and I hate to not agree. I mean, but she was wrong. Mm -hmm. She was wrong. I mean, that record is defining in such a classic for a reason. And it means in that place and time, you know, it's wild. Like my father would always talk about like making records and, you know, you have a run. You have like, you know, even Ringo Starr was like, you get like eight, 10 years maybe. And then, you know, it's, it's different. And when you're in it and you really know something's great, you got to fight for it. Like when you're, when you're at that height of your creative, you know, and some people, you know, shit, some people go for decades, but you know, it's tough. And mm -hmm. I can see where all that fighting was and all that lack mm -hmm. of trust and, you know, I don't know. I, I, I honestly would also say there may have been, and I don't want to be like, you know, I don't want to cause like controversy, but there may have been some racial components. There may have been, there was, you know, I know Donnie, Donnie was really leery of, you know, working with white producers and like he worked with a reef and there's a great story in the, in the, do you guys see that there's a King Curtis book? There's no, a, love to oh, there's a, there's a book about Curtis and they, there's a story in it. I, and I think Layla Hathaway is pissed at me, but basically I shared it with Layla because I had told her, you know, your old man did this thing in the studio with Curtis and like, it's a real story. And she's like, he didn't do that. And I'm like, okay, well, here it is in the book. Curtis and my father produced Donnie on something. Mm. And Donnie was like, I don't want Joel on the record. I just want Curtis to produce it. So Curtis mm. was like, listen, we're both going to produce it and Joel will stay in the control room. So my father just dummied up and, he, you know, just like, I'll just stay in here, Mr. Hathaway. <laughs> like he ended up producing him like two years later and now Reef Martin produced him and, you know, but um, Donnie was pissed at Curtis because he felt like he was going back and forth and saying bad shit. So mm. at the end of the day, he knew they were staying there to do other work. He put tape recorders all through the studio and he captured Curtis saying all this bad shit about him. Wow. <laughs> and, he, and he took it to Amit and Wexler and Curtis had to apologize to everyone. My father was like, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe. I mean, and meanwhile, Donnie was right. Donnie was totally right. Um, I don't think he was right about my dad because um, my dad didn't say shit. And he was like, you know, he's like, hey, I'm here because I, I'm at the label and we got to do this record, you know, so. But mm -hmm. There was yeah, this country. Uh, I, I mean, there's just they, there were really as inclusive as Atlantic was. You can't fight that. You know, there's still like artists want to be artists and they want to, you know, Donnie could have easily produced himself, you know, hell of an arranger. But Arif Martin is a perfect foil for Donnie because he's equally as good an arranger, if not actually maybe 
a little more schooled. Um, so they did okay. <laughs> Arif and Donnie, it worked out. And I love that Arif, Arif has Donnie and my father has Roberta and they come together for the duet record and they killed it. You know, they were really dear friends and I'm dear friends with Arif's son as a result. Like we were, we were tight. It was like good family friends. A lot of Atlantic was about kind of that experience too. I mean, it, it, it was a complicated place because at the bottom of it, it's business. Yeah. So, yeah. You, know, you just want it. It's just like, well, you get, get a hit. You know, you just hear Jerry Wexler yelling, get a hit. I don't get, get back in there and fix it. You know? Yeah. Um, so it's like old school meets like these guys really changing the course of what was coming up until disco. And then they did, they, they all suffered <laughs> except for Arif who produced the Bee Gees. Uh, Arif did okay. Um, and Shaka and Nora Jones, like Arif, Arif had a career for like 50 years, mm. you know, unbelievably always having hits. I was like, damn. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, there were um, the Killing Me Softly record is fascinating because the fact that they got to mix that without her, I think really probably set the stage for her to just be like, I'm done with producing. Like, I'm 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 out. And she she do you know her about her moniker, like her producer moniker, Rubina? Oh, Flake. Rubina Flake, yeah. 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 So she she was just like, I need to do this, and I have. I have to say, even though it was my father, who I don't know if he was ousted or not, I think he had enough too. It was like amicable, amicable split. Mm -hmm. I think she should produce herself. Like that's that that's that record business thing where it's like, how many millions of records do you need to sell? Be and with this goal of like, I want control over my artistry. Mm -hmm. It's like so many other artists got it. Then I'm glad they gave her like the shot to do it. And then I'm glad that she was smart enough to bring in Tume and Reggie Lucas and those guys in on the next record. Cause you know, you need a team, you know, especially yeah. in that, era, you know, you can't. So but, the, the, the thing that you're referring to this Rubina Flake for people who don't know, oh, yeah. this is, can you explain what that was? Well, okay. So it, it's, for me, it's, uh, it's like three layers to it. You have, a black female artist in a extremely patriarchal business mm -hmm. saying that she wants to produce herself. You have an artist that has sold millions of records and is basically like, a, she's a genius, but women weren't producers then. Black women weren't producers then, or if they were, they were uncredited, you know, like the, the typical nonsense of this country's history. Um, so she had every kind of eight ball. She was behind like six eight balls, you know, like the label didn't want her to produce herself. She's a woman. She's a woman of color. Like it's just, you know, it's not a good scenario. And she, she forced her way into the situation of producing herself, but she chose a moniker. So it wouldn't, the pressure, I think, so the pressure wouldn't be like, oh, Roberta Flack produced herself and it's a failure or whatever. She has this fake name, you know, which is obviously, I mean, Ru Rubina Flake, there's no one name. So it's really funny. And I, and I think, you know, there also may have been some weird contractual things and technicalities, but I think the first part of my answer is really the truth. It's just like, you know, it's hard enough to give artists certain freedoms in that era, era but then you're talking about a black woman in the early seventies, it's just labels weren't, progressive and they didn't think you know they didn't get they didn't get out of their own way to let people like hey i got a vision on this let me do it because it became really commonplace in the next 10 years i mean you know mm -hmm. give or take um but yeah, yeah just another you know it's weird i say all of that and i still think like my father's contribution to her career and their partnership when it worked was in incredible and it, and, it, and it doesn't take away from her, you know, she probably learned a lot watching those records get made. She had never really been in the studio before. So it's like, you know, she can't just come in and produce herself from Jump Street. It just, it just doesn't work that way, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's that kind of on that, but. I want to figure out the best way to ask this question. So 
when you have a hit as big as killing me softly yeah. it's great for everybody but yeah. on the other hand when you have someone as creative as joel dorn who also likes the underdog and champions the underdog right how much harder is it then to produce somebody like Rasan roland kirk or an artist who his heart is with but they not, aren't having the same numbers or not hard at all okay because i think i think i know i don't think i know that when he got to atlantic Part of why he went back there was to bring Rasan hadn't been on the label, but but Fathead and Hank and um I'm trying to think Mingus. He he brought artists back into the fold mm -hmm. that he thought should never have left. They should never have been allowed to leave. And I think he treated those records as like this is this is kind of why I'm here. These are guys that I love, these are my friends. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think it was difficult at all. You know, thing you have to remember is that he could be working with Yusef, oh, Yusef Latif, Yusef, Hank, mm -hmm. Roberta, and Bet Midler in the same week. Records weren't like siloed like they became in the 80s where like you have some massive producer and they work with the same act for like a solid year. Mm -hmm. You know, they uh, they worked on stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. constantly so mm -hmm. i think he loved working with those artists but then like when a, i don't think he ever expected to have a scenario like a roberto or a bet midler where it's like something sold millions of copies and now he was never really in that mindset like i'm gonna go produce carol king i'm gonna go produce you know he wasn't like a corporate company not that they're corporate but i'm just saying he was never had that lust for I need to produce this huge act now, like that I produce these, you know, he, he was always like, I want these acts to get the attention they deserve. And, mm -hmm. and I, these are the acts I love, you know, mm -hmm. and not that he didn't love Roberta, but he loved Roberta for, I think for some different reasons, but like Fathead or Hank or Les and Eddie, or that was like family, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was never, never a challenge. I think the real challenge was like more about figuring out the politics of Atlantic. He never was political that way because he would watch a reef um, play the game perfectly. And my father was too, he wore it on his sleeve. You know, he was like, I just want to make a great Rasan record, you know, like, come on, you know, I know we're going to sell like 21,000 units or whatever, but he was all about that. And he, he compromised some things like the label offered him a really nice contract to stay there. And he just said, no, he wanted to keep working on, you know, uh, you know, in the disco era, he floundered because I was like, dude, in retrospect, I'm like, take the contract and ride out disco. You know, you're not going to just stay in Atlantic and make jazz records, you know, for a guaranteed income. Um, but, you know, I, I think that a, a little of that happened to all those artists at that time. Like disco really threw it off, you know. Mm. I mean, Roberta, Roberta had a dip and she came back in the mid 80s, you know um a lot of stuff changed but i will say my favorite thing about her though is the way that um and i know we weren't talking about her specifically but it just dawned on me and i said this earlier the musicians that worked with her that loved her loved her so much like and i knew like multiple generations of people like that went through especially bass players like my friend jerry barnes and his sister catrice like they were they were like mentored by roberta like 25 years after she had her first hits they were like Catrice was like her MD you know mm -hmm. like you know like and they just they loved her they knew that there was ups and downs and that you know there were difficulties on the road and that there there's going to be some moments but she really she's she's a consummate musician and she's great with musicians you know and I think that's so important if you're going to be an artist like that like you know, not subjecting them to the drama, not subjecting them to, you know, they're the, they're like the family that you know you need and you treat them with respect. And, you know, she was great at that. I never heard any musician say like, oh, I hated her. Like, you know, this is, uh, you know, she was, she was very generous with, with, with the folks that work with her. And that's extremely admirable because all of us know that's not like the case most of the time. You know, if you work for someone as 
I remember the first time I went on the road, I thought, well, we're all on the road, so we're all friends. And it's like, no, the artist, <laughs> the artist is separate car, separate flight, separate sections of the, you know, like you don't know the artist. And it was like, I was so naive. I was like, oh man, I made the record and we were buddies in the studio and now we're in Europe and you it's like, I don't exist. And it's like, no, that's how it works. <laughs> you know but she wasn't like that she'd go to people's weddings and have you know she's she she was she's she's good people that way she's great people that way but well i i have a question kind of about her you may or may not have any yeah. insight into this but i guess I, I i took one segment a kind of a significant segment in the the breakdown um that i did on this to talk about uh, kind of how she stands in in the the lineage, I guess, of of black female singers, and how she is kind of the continuation of Nina Simone. How yeah. she sort of picked up right where Nina Simone left off. Uh, she definitely had, well, I don't know. She she I guess she had more commercial success. She did have more more commercial success for longer. She had a, you know has had a much longer career than Nina ever did, and obviously a lot of their personal. Um, things that have influenced that. Yes. Uh, but when people talk about uh, Roberta in, in terms of these, you know, just I'll, I'll stick to just the black female singers, just yeah. the great black female singers of, of her time, really seventies and eighties. I don't necessarily always hear Roberta's name called in that group. I mean, you talk about Gladys Knight, Aretha Franklin, um, Shaka Khan and and we could go on and on Whitney Houston you know in the 80s Roberta's name is rarely called in that group and I feel like um on one hand it could be kind of a um I don't know like a Natalie Cole situation there was another singer that came to mind that might kind of occupy a little bit of the same territory of like Donna Summer you know who was who was really more famous with mainstream audiences her hits were in, on the pop chart, she she was not just an R&B or soul singer, and she really was um, a, a mainstream artist. And black people didn't necessarily take her in, I guess, in that way to say she is ours. She is one of ours. Right. So at least in an hour, and I'm speaking of Greg and I, you know, as being black folks in our in our circles, Roberta Flack's name is not necessarily listed in the pantheon of great black female singers. Um, do you feel that she felt that? Did she, yeah. did she have, what was her experience of, of that? I can't speak to specific things that she said, but I can, I can know without a doubt that the first couple records not resonating with black audiences probably freaked her out. Mm. And, you know, and those were pretty black records from what I've heard. I mean, I can't say very, I've been deep very, into it, but, but from what but I've heard, they are. They, they are, and they're and they're filled with so much social consciousness. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Political, you know, I mean, compared to what is as political a song as you can get, you mm -hmm. know, what I mean? like, it really is, it could, it could it, if done correctly now, it could still be a hit. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think... I think that she is, she's of the world. She's she's not to be pigeonholed into any no. one community. Mm -hmm. And I think that the good part of that is that she's like, you know, world level renowned. But within black music, I don't think that, you know, she's not in that Aretha Shaka. She just isn't. And it's weird to me because she so should Nina, by the way. I think mm -hmm. you bring up Nina, and I think it's a fascinating connection because Nina, who sabotaged things, and I have an interesting story about Nina, but Nina who sabotaged certain things and then had she had mental illness and she mm -hmm. had addiction. And look at her career in the last 20 years, though. Mm -hmm. She has her estate has made more money and had more success than many many other artists mm -hmm. the licensing alone and the the way that nina simone's thing it's i think similarly to rasan there are artists that it's like she happens to be black but she's a world artist and it'll take folks a while to catch up mm -hmm. i think roberta is someone that is right and i hate to say this because it means 
you know, her demise has to occur. But I think Roberta is is really primed for like uh, I'll call it the Roberta sans, like a renaissance of like she's so great and timeless mm -hmm. that it transcends whatever her disappointments may have been with the specific community embracing her or not. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm sure that Donnie's success, his hyper, hyper black success, while she didn't resonate with black audiences, really irked her. And that in order for her to resonate with black audiences, she had to do a duet record with him. That is the first record for her that was a hit. Mm. That introduced her to a lot of black audiences because I think, and Greg, you'll you'll specific, well, both of you will dig this. I think she was getting played on jazz radio, and let, let's face it, not a ton of people even then were listening to jazz radio. She mm. was she was compartmentalized in a specific subsection of a genre of genres, mm. so mm. she just doesn't have that. While I think she should. Once again, it's a matter of race. If she was a white artist singing Killing Me Softly or singing First Time Ever I Saw Your Face angelically like Roberta's, I think we have a different level of, you know, she'll resonate with white audiences and black, you know, and black audiences. Mm -hmm. I think Roberta is, is tricky and confusing to some folks because they, she doesn't have that energetic guttural thing that I think a lot of people look for when they, when they, say things like black music or r and whatever she no bullshit she mm -hmm. is as she is a singer songwriter she is a, an artist and i just think a lot of people don't really still to this day get how great she is and get how masterful she is at what she does you know mm -hmm. I, I hope that makes some sort of sense yep. i think you know it does. It does. But but I want to ask you with, with what you saw. Um, you're a little older than, than us. And I specifically remember in the 80s as a little kid seeing black women and black men, for that matter, amazing singers. But I didn't know they even played instruments because the right. whole record company thing was put them out front with a microphone. Don't attach them to an instrument. So but I remember stupid. in high school when D'Angelo comes out. Right. I was already hip to Donny Hathaway, but I was like, this is the first time that I have seen a black artist blow up that is attached to an yep. instrument. Yep. Have other you seen Stevie, other than Stevie one? That's perfect. Exactly. Oh, yeah. But he, he already went back 30 years prior too. so. Yeah, correct. But, correct. Did you yeah. see the same thing coming up and being in the studio? Was that even a consideration? The labels were like, if they play, we no. don't want to know about it in the video. Let them you know, it's weird. Regarding Roberta, especially in the 80s, I felt a concerted effort to make pop records from her. Like those duets with Peebo or Maxi or, you know, the kind of record she made with Marcus was like, they're going for a pop record. They wanted to be a black pop record, but they were going for a pop record. And they're definitely, and I never understand this. I think the artists and the, and the labels are combined in this, sort of notion of like get on the mic don't sit at the piano like she was very much a sit at the piano kind of artist and i even remember marcus would call my old man and just say like i'm having a hard time in this scenario my father would be like put her at the piano if you put her at the piano when she does her vocals there's a different relationship and synergy between the the, the instrument and her voice and it sits her in a different realm you know listen the 80s were the 80s were an interesting era. Videos were really, if you go back and look at those videos, they're really whack. They're like, you know, they're really yeah, stupid. Yeah, yeah. And they're trying to make her up and, you know, give her some sex appeal. You know, like there's all sorts of stuff going on. And it's like, mm -hmm. throw throw some of that out the window. You know what I mean? Yeah, when he's when you're talking about Marcus, you're speaking of Marcus, Mar Marcus, Marcus Miller. Miller. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Who is? One of the world's best bass players. And you have two bass players on this Zoom. <laughs> would agree to that um uh and he was luther vandross's partner uh in production i think he did about 11 or 12 you know albums with luther they, okay. were, both, they were both in roberta's band before mm -hmm. they became the producer and the artist that they both became or marcus in all fairness as an artist as well 
Um, but yeah, sorry. I, you know, I feel I'm just like, I'm talking to friends. So I'm just saying, you know, cool. Marcus, everyone knows cool. Marcus. Yeah. Cool. But, uh, but no, but, but there, there was this incredible, because we earlier were talking about Ralph McDonald and Mar Marcus and Luther and like, think about the tentacles between coming through Roberta's filter in a pop thing. Luther sings all the backgrounds on Chic records. That's Luther. If you listen to Chic, mm. that's hear Luther at the point. Like it's totally him arranging those vocals and like, you know, and and all these people, they worked on so many different records. You know what I mean? Like they worked together and made magic and art and hits and then they went off on their own and made hits and then they worked with other, you know, that's that's the thing right now, I think, when you asked me, like, what was the last artist you saw sit down at a, key at a keyboard or play a guitar or whatever? That stuff happened because of that community, because of musicians that were writing songs and artists that were really musicians that were writing songs. It was all fostered. Maybe on the label front, certain female artists were taken away from the, you know, the piano or whatever. But that's not now. Now is not about that. And it's a drag because every once in a while, like even if you look at like an Anderson Pack playing drums, playing the crap out of drums, like that to me is just like, oh, finally, like someone that's playing an instrument that's also writing the songs and you see them partaking in the music, not just up on a mic, you know. Um, it's, 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 it's interesting that you bring that up because I can't think, I really can't think of, uh, too many artists that I think of as musicians that are artists. They're generally like, you're the pop star and you know, they throw Ariana Grande out on stage and you know, whatever, you know, it's like, that's what it's kind of become. Um, but that Roberta, when she toured in the eighties, she sat at that piano and she sat at keyboards. So she always maintained musicianship. She's a hell of a musician. Re I mean, she went to, did she go to Howard at 15 or mm -hmm. did she, she was yeah. 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's bananas. Yeah. You know? So musicianship and Roberta is like, boom, they're, you know, they are one and the same. And I think that's why she really got along with the musicians. You know, even when it was Rocky, like they, they always shared that experience. You know the musicianship and the and the and the arrangements and reharming songs like they that that's the part where I'm like she had incredible musicians in her bands so definitely I wouldn't confuse her for whatever she was doing in the 80s was not you know that was an extension into mm -hmm. let's have some hits you know yeah different different artists you know this is such good and it's such good um, info you said you had a story on the. Nina, Nina, I'm kind of curious. Oh, so, I'll, come <laughs> yes. I'll get intimate. It's a wild story. Um, Nina wanted to be signed to Atlantic. And my mm -hmm. father was producing Roberta and Bet uh, around the time that she put, she put feelers out to my father. And my father, his thinking was, I don't think it's a great fit. And if I'm the producer, I don't have the bandwidth to produce Nina Simone and Roberta and Bet. Um, oh, Bet Midler. Mm -hmm. okay. Bet Midler. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Bet Midler. Um, he signed Bet Midler and he produced the first record, and it was big. It was a big hit, and she obviously became like a generational artist. Mm -hmm. So, and and however way he he told Nina that it wasn't going to happen, um, he just couldn't. He didn't have the bandwidth. He he mm -hmm. couldn't produce Nina. And these other artists. Plus, he had all the other roster that, you know, like about six more artists that he was producing. So she didn't take it well. Um, I don't know where she was in her life, where she was living or what was going on. But she tried to hire guys to kill my father. <laughs> and I've talked about this with people from the estate. Yeah. So, so, so my father, luckily, because the record business was a very different thing in, in this era, uh, you there there was people involved uh, that were you know the, the, they ran other businesses and they you know basically it was very, a lot of mafia in the in the record business or adjacent to it so luckily the guys that she called in chicago worked for guys 
that my dad was friendly with friendly with you know so he got a call <laughs> this is another one of those statute of limitations record stories i don't care i can tell this um he got a call like hey we're gonna sort something out someone's trying to have you killed and and he was like who's trying to have me killed you know like he's thinking like you know some rival artist you know whatever well, it was it was a rival artist so i remember as like a four-year-old or a three-year-old oh there man were like dudes outside of our house and i remember asking my dad i'm like why are there two guys like hanging around the house you know and then i asked him a couple years later and he's like i can tell you now and he explained to me like just while they were figuring out to make sure nothing bad happened these guys were hanging i'm like and and I love how hip hop thinks it's so hardcore. I'm like Nina Simone <laughs> tried to have my old man killed. That's more hip hop than any hip hop shit ever. I was like, that is so cool. Um, and the and the messed up thing is, I remember like on one of my records, I got the rights to her song Blackbird to do like this arrangement, and my father was like, no, she tried to have me killed. And I was like, but she's a genius. And he was like, but she tried to have me killed. And I was like, I don't care. I love her and she isn't around anymore. And I want to do it. I ended up, I worked on a remix record with the estate. I love Nina Simone and I would have produced her. I would have been like, I don't care about your band with Knucklehead. You, you produced Nina Simone. And I'm sure it was, you know, really difficult. But I love, I remember I met, I met, I'm trying to think who I met. I was like, it, it wasn't her daughter, but I met someone like somewhat connected to the estate. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I'm working on this in light of the fact that she tried to murder my father. And they just they're like, what? <laughs> yeah. But I love I that's that's what this is all. It's all riddled with these kinds of tales, you know, like these insane, you know, uh stories about these legends that are legends for a reason, you know, mm -hmm. Nina. Ooh, yeah, it, it does not get much better, but a lot comes with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like you can't be that great without like, woo, you know, like yeah. some imbalance. But yeah, so I don't know if that's ending on a high note or, or a happy note. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, but it's definitely a unique note. My man. I, I just did have one clarifying question about um, yeah. about your dad. Um, and his role at, at Atlantic Records, and I didn't want to let you go without oh. asking this because it's just so it's just such a curious thing to me about the way the business worked then, and I don't know if it's still still that way now. Um, mm -hmm. But he's called a producer. That's kind of how he's referred to, and how you said he was hired on. But then it yeah. sounds like he's working more in kind of an an A and R role with how he brought her in and many others. So it was he just was he both? He was both. Because okay. you're, you're at that point, you're a, you're called a staff producer and you're sort of tasked with overseeing and making the records, working with the artists. But you also have to find artists. You have to, you know, A&R really became a different thing, I think, you know, further into the 70s and 80s, you know, especially like in the 90s. It was like A&R was this really weird thing where it was like I would be producing a record and the A&R person maybe 20 years ago would be a producer and an A&R person but they were just strictly finding the talent mm. so they would come in the studio and I'd be like you're not a producer you literally don't know how to produce at all but you're thinking that it's 20 years ago so let's take the foot off the gas pedal but yeah he was a staff producer he signed some artists he also had artists assigned to him like they, the label would sign an artist and they would say, hey, can you produce this artist? We, we just found, you know, I, mean, I can't think of any particular artist that was assigned to him, but, you know, but you worked for the label and they gave you a royalty based on the production, but nothing like what happened in like the 70s, like in the 80s and 90s, producers started getting like giant royalties. Like their royalties back then were like 1%, 2%, whatever, like now, it turned into like guys were getting like, you know, million bucks to produce a record plus six points, plus, you know, all sorts of, you know, pieces of things that that generation of producers didn't make that kind of, I mean, they did if they kept going like a reef or, or Tommy LaPuma or certain guys, but yeah, staff producer. Okay. So, 
employee of the label. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I want to- My pleasure. Yeah. And can you also, Adam, um, tell us about what you have going on? Because I want to include that as well. Just are, are there oh. things that you want people to know about? What do, what do you have going on? Sure. Um, well, so I'm primarily now like a documentary film composer. And I work on like, it's weird. I do action, really violent action films as a composer or documentaries. And documentaries have my heart. I'm, I'm finishing up civil rights documentary right now uh, about a town in Maryland where there was a uh, uh, segregated amusement park that Jews and Blacks helped forcibly open this amusement park. It's mm. called Ain't No, ba Ain't no Back to a Merry-Go-Round. And mm. it's basically about the initial Howard University students and local hyper-liberal Jews working together in this town called Bannockburn to open up this uh, amusement park. And it's a beautiful story. Uh, I just finished the score for that. I just finished um, the score for a doc that's gonna be on American Masters, similar to Roberta, do Roberta Flack's documentary about Governor Jerry Brown. Oh, wow. Uh, which is, it's a good film. Um, interesting career like it's funny I didn't really know as much about him as I thought I did but I've done a lot of other like I did a documentary about Richard Pryor a documentary about Robin Williams multiple docs about Donald J. Trump mm. uh, which there was not enough edibles on the planet after I finished oh scoring that, that was, <laughs> but I, I've worked you know tons of documentaries a lot of political docs civil rights docs um and after doing the albums for for I think I put out about eight or nine albums, it was a nice transition into into for a career, you know, stay at home, raise my kid, not mm -hmm. tour, score films. So, so, so where can people uh, find you on on socials? Do you want people to find you on socials? Sure, I, I'm on really only on Instagram. I got rid of everything when that guy bought Twitter. I deactivated and I've been off Facebook for six years. Uh, Instagram, it's at motion worker, um, which is spelled M O C E A N worker, one word. Mm -hmm. And the motion worker stuff is all like thirties and forties, big band jazz with funky beats. Like my whole thing was like, I love really old music. So I, I used to love people telling me like, well, your record's kind of old. And I'm like, yeah, it is old. It's about 78 years old. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so you can't tell me it's out of style because it was made out of style to begin with. So yeah, the most marker stuff is fun. It's like jazz, but it's not, you know, it's like funky, you know. Yeah. Good that's stuff. Stuff like I can... Really good stuff. Thanks, man. I yep. appreciate it. Absolutely. Ah, well, thank you so much, Adam. We, right, we're just honored you, to have you. We really are. He just um, Adam is our first guest. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, he is our first, very first special guest and he will not oh. be the last, but we're honored that you have actually taken this position. Um, oh, amazing. So lovely to catch up with you guys. And you to too, see you, man. Adam. Thanks again.